On a late Friday evening in my office, I was assessing a few candidates who had heard about an upcoming vacancy in our office staff. I served as the regional head of a chemical company supplying products for control, fertilizer, and water containment for soil. Our company relied heavily on farmers who cultivated or supplied our food. Being environmentally conscious, we proudly boasted our products as completely eco-friendly, a pioneering move in our industry. Two of my office staff's spouses had been promoted, prompting them to tender their resignations. Both would be relocating within the next three months, sparking a rush to fill their positions swiftly. Our sales team operated across eight states in the heart of the nation. Surpassing our sales projections this year was a significant achievement. Kathy, my executive assistant, popped her head into my office to inform me, Ed, all eight candidates have confirmed their interview appointments for Monday. I'm off for the night. Every Thursday, I traveled to one of the states under my jurisdiction to conduct a half-day sales meeting on Fridays before returning home. Consequently, Thursday nights had become my wife's designated evening to socialize with her friends, albeit incurring considerable babysitting expenses over the years. My weekly excursions provided crucial face-to-face -face support for our sales representatives, fostering their job performance and problem-solving skills. This investment had yielded substantial returns over the years, with not a single resignation in eight years, an accomplishment for our company. Today, I had just made it back in time to wrap up a few tasks before heading home. The company had persistently urged me to relinquish this aspect of my role, but I found the solitude during these trips invaluable for contemplation. With a wife who knew everything and three children, these moments of quiet reflection during drives were invaluable, besides sparing the branch the expense of hiring a sales manager. Maintaining a record of staying under budget was a priority for me. With our children in junior and senior high school, our eldest, a source of immense pride, set to graduate and attend Southeast Missouri University in the fall, our family was in a favorable position. Her full scholarship awarded by my employer was a significant boon. Our youngest daughter, just 16, was busy preparing for her learner's permit. Grace, my wife of 20 years, served as the executive assistant to the district attorney since our youngest's birth. The district attorney had recently been offered a lucrative position with the federal government, which he promptly accepted. Known for his no-nonsense approach, it was a no-brainer, given the substantial increase in salary. Despite being roughly the same age as me, he had never married. Contrary to rumors, I doubted he was gay. For the past 15 years, my parents had graciously taken our three children every second weekend of the month, affording my wife and me some much-needed quality time together. This gesture came at a pivotal moment in our marriage, allowing us to rediscover ourselves and ultimately strengthening our bond. Without their support, we might have added to the divorce statistics. They had approximately three months left before this chapter would close, as my eldest, Amy, was set to intern in our senator's office in Washington over the summer before embarking on her political science studies at the university. A while back, my dad, on a whim, purchased Ancestry.com kits for each of our three children, with my consent, and submitted them as a jest. Following their guidelines, we understood that a match would only occur if a relative had also submitted their DNA. My children discussed it with me, and I granted permission, acknowledging that we all have distant relatives we might not know about. Perhaps it would lead us on a new journey. Amy suggested keeping it a surprise for her mother until we received the results, aware it could take five or six months. This weekend, we were traveling to Nashville to attend the Grand Ole Opry and would return home on Sunday. It was my wife who organized this special trip, aiming to create another cherished memory in our journey together. Update. During my final year at university, I crossed paths with my wife, Grace, at a football game. Contrary to being a player on the field, I was one of those anonymous vendors peddling overpriced snacks to the crowd. Grace, being one of the daughters of the team's medical staff, always had complimentary tickets at her disposal. An altercation ensued between her and her date over a trivial matter, resulting in a shove that inadvertently involved me. As she pushed him away, he collided with me, sending me tumbling down the concrete stairs with my food tray in tow. 
I regained consciousness in the hospital, my head swathed in bandages, the doctor informing me of 25 stitches due to a split forehead. Grace visited me daily, burdened with guilt, and met my entire family during my recovery from a week-long coma caused by internal injuries. As the haze lifted from my sight, I perceived an unfamiliar goddess-like figure before me, initially mistaking her for a celestial being guiding me to the afterlife. Yet the reality of my girlfriend, Esmeralda, standing by her side brought clarity, albeit disappointment to her reaction. Hoping it was all a dream, I drifted back into sleep, yearning for Esmeralda's absence upon awakening, a wish that materialized when I opened my eyes to find her gone, replaced by Grace, who steadfastly supported me as I pieced my life back together. Though I never formally asked her, our relationship naturally evolved, culminating in marriage three months later as Grace walked down the aisle, captivating with her five-foot-eight stature, long blonde locks, deep blue-black eyes, and an enviable figure. By our fifth year together, we found ourselves at a crossroads, contemplating separation without fully comprehending the reasons behind our drift. Despite my confusion, Grace and I remained committed, eventually resolving to overcome whatever obstacles lay ahead. We had just departed from Lambert's on our way home, a restaurant coasting on its reputation. Their claim to fame was tossing large buns across the room for customers to catch, overshadowing the otherwise lackluster, overcooked food. We made the stop at this tourist trap because it evoked memories of my wife's mother's cooking. Need I say more? Grace initiated a conversation with me, expressing her thoughts on the concept of infidelity within our marriage. She suggested that I should explore the idea of having an affair, indicating that she would approve of it. Grace reasoned that societal norms regarding marriage vows had changed and that I should reconsider my stance. She believed that such an experience might enrich our relationship and deepen our understanding of each other. Her perspective troubled me, suggesting a willingness to exploit others for personal gratification, a stance I couldn't accept. It revealed a side of her I hadn't seen before, reshaping my perceptions considerably. Let me ask you this, my dear wife, I countered. Why is it so important to you that I have your blessing for an affair? Have I done something so repulsive that you're seeking a reason to end our marriage? Five minutes of silence ensued before I resumed the music her lack of response speaking volumes. Grace was always quick with an answer, but now she was silent, leaving me to ponder why. I couldn't shake the feeling that my wife's sudden approval of an affair was significant, though its motive remained elusive. Regardless, I was convinced something was amiss in our lives and resolved to uncover it. Driving for an hour, we were about 40 miles from home when Grace again silenced the sound. I switched on the recorder once more. I apologize, Ed, she said. I suppose I've been indulging in too many Harlequin romance stories. Those notions must have come from out of nowhere. Having said that, she resumed the sound system, assuming the matter was settled. However, the dilemma arose from the fact that both our children and I knew she despised those books, as they had been her mother's favorite. Throughout her life, she had dismissed them as lowbrow and beneath her. Whenever her mother passed the latest editions to her, Grace would promptly discard them. During the last leg of our drive, I realized the only aspect of her life I knew little about was her Thursday night outings with her friends. It hadn't seemed significant or concerning enough to inquire about. On the rare occasions when I was home, she willingly altered her plans to spend the evening with me. Until today, I had no reason to doubt those nights, as I had complete trust in her. However, following our recent conversation, I found myself questioning the nature of her girl's night out. Was she frequenting bars with her friends, engaging in questionable activities like one-night stands? By the time we arrived home, I resolved to uncover the truth about her Thursday night outings. After settling in at home, I spent some time with my parents, enjoying their company and hearing about their weekend activities. They mentioned wanting to have a private chat with me the following day, expressing concern about my wife and her youngest daughter but didn't elaborate further. We agreed to meet around three o'clock when I would be available after my job interviews. Later, when saying goodbye, I assured them I'd address their concerns after work. Once they left, I informed my wife about the plan to visit my parents the next day to fix something, ensuring she was aware of the potential delay for dinner. She acknowledged it, 
assuring me it was fine to eat later. My dad and mom arrived promptly, and we ushered them into my office. After settling in, we waited for one of the staff to bring us coffee. Once served, Kathy closed the door as she left. Ed, my dad began, I deeply regret sending in our grandchildren's DNA. They found a match for April. She has a grandmother on her father's side searching for her son and his descendants. With that, he produced the form from Ancestry.com, displaying a lady's name and phone number. I was devastated, and my father could see the impact the news had on me. Dad, I don't believe it's a mistake. Let's see what we can find out together, I said. Using the office phone, I dialed the number and activated both the recording and speaker functions to ensure a permanent record of the conversation. After two rings, someone answered. I'm Edward Paul Adams, seeking Mrs. Beatrice Smith regarding a DNA match from Ancestry.com, I explained. May I speak with her? You're speaking with her, young man, came the reply. What can I do for you? It's complicated, I replied. Long story short, I've just learned that my youngest daughter is your granddaughter. Are you referring to April Marie Adams? She asked. Yes, I confirmed. Then perhaps you know my son, whom I had to give up for adoption at 15, Mrs. Smith continued. I might if I knew his name, I responded. He was adopted by a family named Barrow. His given names were Luke Robert, Mrs. Smith revealed. My heart sank. My parents and I recognized the name all too well. Her candid admission had turned into a nightmare for me. He's alive and well, I disclosed. Currently, he serves as the district attorney here in Cape Girardeau County, Missouri. He's also my wife's boss. And now, I think I understand why he never married. He's my only child, Mrs. Smith confessed. I'm battling stage four lung cancer and don't have much time left. Would you allow April to visit me before I pass away? If needed, I'll cover the expenses. I want to meet her and pass on my estate to her. Given the circumstances, I'll let you coordinate with my parents. They'll arrange for her to visit this weekend, I agreed. But I can't let her travel alone. Is there anything else you need? Please provide a notary statement for my lawyer to conduct a DNA test, Mrs. Smith requested. He'll want to verify her identity before changing my will, given the value of her inheritance. No problem. I'll hand over the call to my dad and he'll handle the details, I assured her. Exiting my office, I handed Kathy my personal recorder, instructing her to transcribe and notarize both my conversation and the phone call. This is necessary for the divorce proceedings, I added. Do you want the authorization for the DNA test drawn up too? Kathy inquired, demonstrating her keen awareness of the situation. Yes, please, but keep it quiet for a few weeks. I want to investigate my soon-to-be ex-wife's Thursday night activities, I replied. Turning to my assistant, David, I requested his and his wife's cooperation for a personal matter, signaling the seriousness of the situation. Shorty should be finishing her dispatch soon. I'll text her to come over right away, David responded, recognizing the gravity of the situation. I returned to my office and we reached an agreement. Using the spare key they had for my house, they planned to pack some clothes for April and leave next Friday. I'd have her pulled out of school and drop her off at their place by 10 o'clock. As I saw my parents off, David's wife entered. I directed her to his office, where I'd join them shortly. Thanks to modern communication methods, Kathy had already made copies and transcribed the documents. I handed David and Cheryl a copy, suggesting they start with my conversation with my wife. I gave Kathy the paperwork my dad had provided to make copies for my lawyer's files, instructing her to find the best. Cheryl and David, longtime acquaintances, were deeply affected by recent revelations concerning my wife and me. Cheryl, particularly, had a close relationship with Grace, having grown up as neighbors. The discovery of the truth had left them both shocked. We discussed potential actions to uncover more information. I suggested a plan involving David using my company car for sales trips, while Cheryl would use David's car with the pretext of cross training for the next three months. Meanwhile, I planned to follow my wife on Thursday nights to gather evidence discreetly. My suspicion grew as I recounted recent events, particularly Grace's suggestion for me to have an affair. I speculated that she might be planning to move with Luke Robert Barrow, which could lead to justifying a divorce in her eyes if she could prove my infidelity. Cheryl expressed her agreement and suggested involving the police to gather more detailed information about their activities. She even mentioned a contact who could help arrange it. 
Later, Kathy informed us about Dale Allen Britton's departure from the district attorney's office and his new practice. Cheryl asked me to convey her regards to Dale when I visited him. In summary, we devised a plan to uncover more information and sought legal counsel to handle the situation. I left to meet Dale, a man involved in the women's right to life movement, challenging Roe v. Wade in the Supreme Court. His unconventional approach to the law was shaking up everything he touched. Things started to make sense. My marital issues with Grace coincided with her employment under Luke Barrow, around the time I was promoted to sales manager, requiring frequent overnight sales meetings. If they were indeed having an affair every Thursday night, I had unknowingly been deceived for over 15 years. The expensive gifts from Luke to Grace now seemed suspicious. Dale was ready for me when I arrived. Cheryl had briefed him on our plans. He provided me with access to Luke Barrow's house and the alarm code. Handing me a phone number, he said it would connect me with helpful services at a reasonable price. Having grown up on the streets, Dale still had connections to get things done. The access codes he provided would remain valid until the end of the week, after which Luke would be reminded to change them. Dale planned to sue Barrow for child support from April's birth, potentially bankrupting him under state law. He also suggested temporarily transferring my parental authority to my parents until the court case concluded to prevent accusations of manipulation. I offered to pay him up front, but he declined, fearing Grace would detect it. Instead, he requested a check to be cashed after the legal proceedings commenced. His strategic thinking assured me that he had my best interests at heart. I left with the impression that Dale had his own motives for targeting Luke Barrow, both Grace and Luke were in for a rude awakening. Dale Britton had devised his own strategy for the divorce proceedings. Update. I completed all necessary paperwork, granting my parents parental rights over April starting Friday, and provided them with a copy. After Dale and I briefed them on the situation, they agreed it was the right move. I waited for Cheryl to arrive in her 2002 Ford Taurus as David was away on his first sales trip. Cheryl would leave her car with me and take David's home. My eldest informed me that their mother wouldn't be home for dinner, joining her friends straight from work. Once Cheryl arrived, we swapped cars, and I packed my suitcase in the trunk. Ed, Cheryl said, dispatch and the guys are ready. Just tell me where to go. Thanks, I replied. Dale wants me to call him if we proceed so he can serve them personally. I'm curious about Dale's vendetta against Luke Barrow. Dale's all about principles. Cheryl explained. Luke's known for not sticking to his word. It was intriguing to observe Grace and Luke depart in separate cars, meeting later at Charlie's Bar and Grill for dinner. Afterward, they went their separate ways. I positioned myself near Luke Barrow's residence, with Dale's associates, now my team, fully prepared. I had a clear view of Luke's house from a safe location. Grace arrived first, disabling the alarm with a code and unlocking the door. We recorded her entering. Moments later, Luke pulled in and Grace greeted him at the door. Her blouse was open, braless, revealing her cleavage. Luke embraced her, kissing passionately. As they entered, I ceased filming. Six rooms in Luke's house were wired for audio and video, courtesy of his neighbor's son serving time. Everything inside was streamed live on their Facebook pages. They were monitoring my car, expecting me to seek a new romantic interest. Anticipating this, they had hired a courtesan who matched my preferences. I alerted Cheryl, who informed David. As an ex-Marine, he skillfully veered off-road safely at 10 p.m., then called for assistance. Cheryl notified me, and I confirmed the green light, providing the address. While awaiting developments, I tampered with the valves in their car tires, ensuring they couldn't escape the predicament they were about to face. The adulterous pair wouldn't be going anywhere anytime soon. The police officers arrived, sirens blaring and banged on the door, seeking Grace Adams. Luke Barrows initially denied her presence until the cops pointed out her car in the driveway. Grace eventually appeared, clad only in a bedsheet. Mrs. Grace Adams, your husband Edward Paul's car was in a motor vehicle accident near Little Rock, Arkansas. We were directed to check here by your parents when we couldn't locate you, the officer stated, intentionally misleading her. Grace's face paled at the news. As the police departed, I followed closely behind. 
Every moment from their arrival to departure was recorded and streamed live on Facebook, providing irrefutable evidence of the ongoing affair to the citizens of Cape. At midnight, my daughter Amy called in distress, reporting that her mother hadn't returned home and wasn't answering calls. I advised her to contact Luke Barrow and insisted he put Grace on the phone. Why him? Amy questioned. He's been her Thursday night companion for over 16 years, I revealed. After sending Amy a clip of Grace and Luke's encounter with the police, she soon discovered her mother's deception. Upon Amy's revelation, I instructed her to open the front door, preparing to confront Grace. As I retrieved my suitcase from the car, Dale Allen Britton called, informing me he had served restraining orders against Grace and Luke, prohibiting them from coming near us. Amy, open the garage so I can park Cheryl's car inside, I instructed, pretending to be on my way to Little Rock. We complied with the plan. Amy questioned the recent locksmith visit, to which I confirmed it was part of our preparations, prompted by the DNA test my father submitted to Ancestry.com, comma, revealing a match for April and uncovering Grace's connection to her boss, who turned out to be the son she gave up for adoption at 15. Amy, my daughter, became emotional. I embraced her tightly until she regained composure. Then we dimmed the lights and retreated to the kitchen for a private conversation. I activated my voice recorder and played the discussion between her mother and me during our return journey from Nashville. It provided Amy with insight into her mother's words firsthand. Why would mom encourage you to have an affair, dad? Amy inquired. To mitigate the consequences of her own actions if they were ever exposed, I replied. Ironically, her suggestion led to the truth emerging. A soft knock interrupted us. Since I wasn't expected to be home, Amy answered the door. It was a police officer who informed us that they had intercepted a taxi carrying Grace. They warned her of violating a court order if she proceeded further. Throughout the night, my eldest daughter and I discussed Grace's actions. We both agreed that given her talent for storytelling during her girls' night out, she should have pursued a career in writing. Amy expressed disbelief at the revelation that her mother had been having an affair with the same man for over 16 years. She wondered why they hadn't noticed sooner. I explained that it was easy to overlook because the kids were young, and I frequently traveled for work, trusting in our relationship and seeing no reason to question Grace's activities. Amy reflected on how their trust in Grace had blinded them to the truth. Realizing the extent of Grace's manipulation, I was stunned. Amy pointed out that the most painful aspect was how Grace had exploited their trust to maintain her affair. As Amy went to make coffee, I noticed the dawn approaching and received a text from Grace, urgently requesting to talk about a family issue concerning our oldest child before my return from the trip. Deciding how to respond, I reassured Amy and replied to Grace's message, declining her manipulation and informing her that she could continue her plans with Luke Barrow, but without the kids. I explained that Grace had wanted me to start an affair to use against me in divorce court and never expected to be caught after so many years. It must have been painful for Amy to hear the truth. Many struggle to accept harsh realities. Eventually, they will come to terms with it. I embraced my daughter as she shed tears once more. We had just calmed her down when Eric and April woke up. I turned on the kitchen TV to watch the morning news. Soon they joined us for breakfast, surprised to see me at home. We were all taken aback when my wife's image appeared on the screen. My son raised the volume out of curiosity. My heart went out to my kids as they heard Grace and Luke disparaging me, calling me foolish and clueless. Their mother then made a sarcastic comment about me, which caused both of them to burst into laughter. The reporter interjected, suggesting that they weren't laughing anymore after the scheme they had orchestrated to set up Edward Adams with a professional escort had backfired. The scene shifted to Dale serving them both with lawsuits, with the news reporter elaborating on the details. Alice ran to me sobbing and sat on my lap, discovering in a harsh way that her biological father wasn't her father, but her mother's long-term lover. Eric summed it up aptly, questioning what their mother's view of their father meant for the rest of them. Once April had composed herself, Amy and I explained what had occurred since their mother and I returned from Nashville. I arranged for them to be excused from school on Friday and Monday to process their emotions. Just as we were about to start breakfast, April exclaimed that the police chief was on the line. 
That caught our attention, so we turned up the volume. It was publicly announced that both Grace Adams and Luke Barrow, our current district attorney, were under criminal investigation. A special team from across the county was assembled to lead the inquiry. I thought to myself that when one's private actions become public, society cannot overlook them. Hypocrisy reigns in our society every day. After breakfast and tidying up, I had my three children sit down at the table. I showed each of them a copy of the letter my dad had received. Then I said, April, my parents are picking you up to take you to meet your biological dad's mother. She's terminally ill and has requested to see you. There's a significant reason behind it, but I think it's best for the lady you're meeting to explain it to you. As far as I'm concerned, you are my daughter and always will be. If you have any questions, ask your grandparents. Amy, can you assist your sister in packing for the weekend while I call my parents? I asked. Once the girls left, my son asked, How are you handling this, Dad? I'm struggling, I admitted. I'm constantly fighting to keep myself composed. Remember, son, if this ever happens to you as a father, you have to stay strong for everyone else in your life. With that said, I called my parents and explained my whereabouts. They said they would come over as soon as they finished packing their car. They still had an hour before their flight. It was in that moment that my sons and my relationship changed forever, for the better. The three of us watched the daughter I had raised leave with my parents to meet her biological grandmother for the first time. I prayed fervently that it would go well and that she would return feeling the same about me. The atmosphere at the local district attorney's office resembled a morgue. Grace Adams had gone out to buy new clothes after having her car towed and the four tires' stems replaced. Meanwhile, Luke Barrow was reviewing the lawsuit against him. Although they lacked a direct DNA sample, the biological link was undeniable, leaving him unable to deny parentage. The truth about their relationship and long-term affair had become known to everyone on staff. This, along with concealing April Adams' true parentage, was turning into a political nightmare. Fraud under the law had evolved to encompass the failure to disclose all pertinent facts, leading Dale to sue both Grace and Luke jointly in a civil suit. It increasingly appeared that they had been deceiving Grace's husband, Ed, for years. While many lawyers affirmed Ed Adams and Dale Britton's likely success, those contacted so far were unwilling to get involved, likely due to Dale's formidable reputation in court. The Facebook exposure of their conduct and their admission of attempting to ruin an honest man to benefit themselves was headline news, given Ed's societal position. Grace, having frequented a familiar clothing store for years, never anticipated being confronted by a woman accusing her of insanity, claiming she should have foreseen the consequences. This revelation came when the lady accused her of appearing in compromising photos on Facebook for hours. Upon returning to Luke's house, Grace found a company finishing a service call, assuming she was the homeowner and suggesting resetting the security codes. Only later did she realize the lack of electronic signature verification. Calling Luke, Grace questioned who was trying to sabotage his new position in St. Louis, prompting her to reveal her discoveries. They both suspected deeper motives beyond Ed protecting himself, given the political nature of his new job. After making coffee, Grace reviewed the divorce petition. It stung to realize that her own words had aroused her husband's suspicions, especially her requests for him to deliberately damage others. Furthermore, the revelation from mom and dad Adams about the Ancestry.com DNA match exposed April's true parentage, offering undeniable proof of her affair and potentially jeopardizing their marriage before April's birth. At that moment, she realized Ed needed to know if the affair was ongoing. He had orchestrated the events of the previous night, revealing hidden truths about her life. Just as she took another sip of coffee, the doorbell rang. Rising, she answered it to find the neighbor Luke disliked. Mr. Primrose, she greeted, what can I do for you? Handing her a legal envelope, he explained, Ed used my place as a base for his operations against you and your long-term lover last night. I permitted it gladly as Luke Barrow had my son sentenced to the maximum. The information in this envelope shared with you last night will also be delivered to everyone on your side of the family this afternoon. Ed asked if you're still laughing at him. Watching him walk away with a broad smile, Grace returned to the kitchen and opened the envelope, filled with incriminating pictures. 
They depicted her entering Luke's house with her key, greeting him at the door, engaging in lovemaking activities, and being confronted by police officers. Ed's team was efficient, making it seem like he collaborated with police officers seeking retribution against Luke. The final signed page by her husband revealed the potential for significant public fallout, jeopardizing her plans to assert control over him. Now the priority was damage control to mitigate the fallout from Ed's public disclosure. Grace. By last Sunday evening upon returning home from Nashville, it became apparent to me that you were scheming to orchestrate our divorce. Since then, I've been trying to discern what led your affection for me to transform into pure animosity. Now I understand the reason behind it. I realize you hold me responsible for what you perceive as deficiencies in your life during the period when we only had our two children. It seems you felt confined in our marriage and yearned for the carefree days of being single again. Otherwise, you wouldn't have willingly sought solace in another man to relive the single life. By doing so, you allowed him to temporarily whisk you away from what you despised a few hours each week. I recognize that the sole reason you remained in a marriage with a man you despised and saw as lifeless was because Luke didn't want the burden of raising kids, not even his own. With your perception of me, there was no way you'd leave the children alone with someone you considered worthless. Your pride wouldn't allow it, leading you to endure a lifetime of deliberate falsehoods. Every day you both evaded consequences, your disdain for me grew. I became increasingly foolish and incompetent in your eyes. How much laughter did you and Luke share at the expense of the oblivious betrayed man? Did you boost his affection for you by belittling or mocking me? What I can't forgive or forget is the message you and the one you regard as your true husband have conveyed to our children, as it will shape their lives indefinitely. I've yet to comprehend the extent of amusement Luke and you derived from manipulating me and our children's lives as if we were mere pawns on a chessboard. The KVOS 12 news reporter aptly captured this when questioning whether you still found amusement in Edward Adams, husband of Grace Adams. I observed Amy, Eric, and April witnessing as you and your lover publicly disclosed your intentions towards me through the media. It was heartbreaking to witness our children as you casually joked about how effortless it would be to bring down the foolish idiot. Our son Eric remarked, If mom sees you as nothing but trash to be discarded, what does she really think of us? I haven't broached the topic of your future relationship with them yet. Currently, it's fair to say it's non-existent due to your and Luke's profound disgust and contempt towards me. At least we're both aware that you derive joy from leaving me branded as a clueless fool for life. Perhaps tonight, you and Luke can celebrate your victory with a toast. Ed, update. Grace's hands began to tremble so violently that she dropped the paper. She appeared spiteful, bitter, and cruel, showing no concern for her children, husband, or anyone else. It was evident that she cared only about herself and satisfying her carnal desires. Her sobs shattered the room's silence. Ed had a knack for undermining one's credibility without direct condemnation. His observations about their conduct left no room for dispute among readers. In his view, every action she took was to sustain her lifestyle, not out of love. He likely realized that Luke was urging her to leave him and the children before April's conception. Luke's new job forced them to accelerate their plans, originally set for after April's high school graduation. While she wasn't laughing anymore, Ed effectively pointed out that their actions validated his words. Ed believed their disdain for him prompted their attempt to destroy him. Without explicitly stating it, it was a declaration of war. If he went down, he'd take them down with him. Grace resumed reading the divorce petition, finding it utterly devastating. One of the suits accused them of fraud for concealing April's true parentage. The damages sought in the fraud case made her feel sick. If Ed won, both she and Luke would face financial ruin. Ed and his lawyer were proving that they could no longer underestimate him as the fool they believed him to be. Update. Saturday was chaotic for my two eldest children and me. From early morning until around four in the afternoon, we had family members dropping by. Grace's parents, her two brothers, one sister, and their spouses came to offer their support, each bringing one of their favorite dishes to ensure we had something to eat. Even my brother and sister visited from out of town to check up on me. The three of us were enveloped in love and support. 
Each visitor found it difficult to grasp how they could have been deceived by Grace for so long. They all agreed that what had surfaced on social media proved she was trying to destroy me out of hatred. My father-in-law and I went on to the back deck for a moment, where he suggested I let go of whatever was bothering me. He assured me that Cora would keep others away until I felt better and stayed with me until I calmed down. He mentioned plans to revise his will, intending to divide Grace's share among my three children. He expressed his disappointment in Grace's actions, stating that he could never forgive her for what she had become. Later, my father called to inform me that April had met the lady and that their meeting went well. Mrs. Smith seemed interested in our family's situation and helped April open up about her feelings. The lawyer obtained the necessary blood sample and had a private chat with my father. They discussed Luke Barrow, and my father shared what we knew about him. It was revealed that Luke's real father was serving a life sentence for a serious crime, and April's arrival had a significant impact on his inheritance. I assured my father that Dale Britton had taken legal measures to keep Luke away from us. Our day had been busy with family members from both sides offering support. My parents were staying as guests at Mrs. Smith's estate, where April was currently with her. They liked Mrs. Smith, and her lawyer mentioned that seeing April had brought a smile to her face after a long time. My mom then spoke to me, mentioning a conversation she had with Mrs. Smith about me and expressing gratitude for how we handled the situation. Mrs. Smith planned to leave everything in a trust for April to be managed by me until she turned 25. Before ending the call, I requested that my parents text me when they were leaving so I could be there when they brought April home. I messaged April, letting her know that we all miss her and sending our love, Dad. Finally, we found time to clean up before David and Cheryl arrived with my car. I apologized to Cheryl for forgetting to return it. Cheryl mentioned that the police chief saw an opportunity to bring down Luke Barrow, and that he and Dale were collaborating. Dale had provided some questionable items for the investigators to examine. David shared that the atmosphere at the office was heavy, and everyone was upset upon his return. He informed them generally that some of them had been aware of the situation for most of the week, and were offering assistance where possible. I commented that it had been an emotional roller coaster since Thursday night, and that the kids were still struggling at times, so I planned to take Monday off too. Cheryl inquired if I had heard from Grace, to which I responded that I hadn't since Thursday night. I speculated that Luke and she were probably busy moving on with their lives, as they had publicly made it clear how they saw us. Early Sunday morning, my youngest daughter called to ask if it was okay for her and her grandparents to return home late on Monday. I agreed, pending her grandparents' approval. She thanked me for insisting she go and explained that Mrs. Smith had helped her accept that it wasn't her fault because her mother's affair had brought her into the world. She expressed her love for me before hanging up. Amy, Eric, and I observed as my parents arrived in our driveway on Monday evening. They appeared stressed and weary. As soon as my mom stepped out of the car, she rushed into my arms. I must admit, it felt comforting to have my youngest daughter back home. Dad opened the trunk and brought in her suitcase, which Eric promptly took up to her bedroom. The three of them then gathered in the family room so April could share about her new grandmother, allowing my parents and me a chance to catch up. We retreated to the kitchen where I brewed a fresh pot of coffee while my parents shared their impressions of Mrs. Beatrice Smith. She seemed at peace when we left, Dad remarked. It was as if she had come to terms with her impending pass away. Meeting April and seeing her acceptance meant a lot to her. Mom pulled out a legal size envelope from her purse and handed it to me, explaining, This was given to me by her lawyer, per Beatrice's instructions. I opened it and found a letter, along with a check for $50,000. The letter was brief and straightforward. The grand lady thanked me for fulfilling her request, mentioning that she had already surpassed her expected lifespan before our contact. DNA had confirmed the biological connection, and she commended me for raising April well. She urged me to use the funds to navigate through the challenging times we were facing and to stay true to my values. I allowed my parents to read it, and we pondered the possibility that we had fulfilled someone's dying wish. Over coffee, I briefed them on everything that had occurred during their absence. I expressed my belief that the worst of the emotional turmoil for our family was behind us, and we could return to our normal routine starting the next day. The remainder of the week proceeded relatively smoothly, all things considered.
Grace attempted to reach out to each of our children by phone, but was met with rejection. Meanwhile, the corporate headquarters was pleased that I was no longer managing the sales meetings and began the search for a new sales manager for the first time in a decade. As I sat in my office reviewing monthly sales figures, Kathy entered, expressing concern about trouble brewing. I inquired about the issue, and she informed me that my recent letter to Grace had been posted online on the Southeastern Missouri newspaper's website. We quickly accessed the website's Speak Out section and found the letter. Kathy read it aloud, and I acknowledged that I had written it in a moment of emotional distress, wondering if I had been too harsh. Kathy disagreed, stating that the letter simply stated the reality of Grace's long-term behavior in a direct manner. She pointed out that either of them could have ended the affair and come clean, but Luke had enjoyed the benefits without bearing the costs. We discussed how rare it was for society to witness the consequences of someone's actions on a family in such a public manner. Kathy remarked that, as someone who had experienced divorce, it served as a stark reminder of the pain and suffering endured before finding solace. I then mentioned a comment on the website from a longtime feminist, highlighting how Grace and Luke's actions had tarnished the movement for equality and empowerment. Later, Grace and Luke sat at Charlie's Bar and Grill for dinner. Despite it typically being bustling on Friday nights, the place was unusually empty, with vacant tables surrounding them. When they inquired with the waitress, she explained that people were waiting but refused to be seen sitting near them in public, likely because they had read my recent letter to Grace on the newspaper's website. They swiftly requested the bill and departed, realizing they needed to lay low in public for the foreseeable future. Both were grappling with the reality that their actions had significantly restricted their social circle. As they exited, Grace spotted her parents seated at a nearby table, waiting for their order. She approached them, with Luke trailing behind. Upon hearing her voice, her father addressed them coldly. Mr. Barrow, I suggest you remove your mistress from here and allow my wife and me to enjoy our meal in peace. Grace left the restaurant in tears, finally comprehending that there was no turning back once you crossed a certain line. She realized she would live with the consequences of her and Luke's actions for the rest of her life. Returning to Luke's place, they visited the website and saw firsthand the public's overwhelming disdain for both of them. Update. I sat in the passenger seat of my car observing April Drive. We departed this morning for Wichita, Kansas upon learning of her grandmother Beatrice's passing. Heading to the airport to catch the private plane provided by the estate, April was deeply affected, having grown close to her grandmother through their frequent phone calls. Amy and Eric had been a tremendous help, bringing the four of us closer together. They were both urging me to start dating again, but I've been hesitant. Once bitten, twice shy. Meanwhile, Luke and Grace had relocated to St. Louis. Luke was allowed to start his job early by the feds, with the county eager to rid itself of him once he repaid over $45,000 in questionable expenses. They now resided in a two-bedroom rented apartment, preparing for the possibility of bankruptcy due to an impending civil lawsuit. According to Missouri bankruptcy laws, they could retain only $10,000 each in equity. Our divorce had been finalized according to state law, with Grace obligated to provide child support for our kids while they were in school and cover 50% of their living expenses if they resided on campus. The civil trial for fraud was set to begin in two weeks, my kids still refused to speak to their mother, and neither did her side of the family. She had learned the hard way that people will only tolerate so much before walking away forever. April had to endure a meeting arranged by the state's child services with her biological father, which did not go well. She informed him, in the presence of child services representatives, that both he and her mother were dead to her. We attended her grandmother's funeral, after which the lawyer disclosed the substantial inheritance left to us. Overwhelmed, April and I decided to sell her grandmother's home and its contents, except for personal jewelry and a few photos that April wanted. Upon returning home as the school year ended, I prepared for the first day of court on Wednesday when April entered the den. April asked if I could arrange a meeting with Luke, her mom, their lawyers, and Dale on Tuesday, expressing her desire for them to understand the real cost of their actions, an idea suggested by Grandma Beatrice. 
So I called Dale, and we arranged it. It was a bright, beautiful, sunny day when we sat down with Luke, Grace, and their lawyers. April explained that she requested the meeting to Luke, her biological father, handing him a sealed envelope containing his father's location and his request for him to visit him in jail, disclosing the circumstances of her conception. She revealed that her biological grandmother had left her over a hundred million dollars in a trust managed by her father, Edward Adams, until she turned 25, which would have been Luke's if she hadn't been discovered. She warned Luke and Grace of possible legal escalations, urging them to consider mediation before resorting to court. Leaving that meeting, I felt both proud and humbled. My daughter had spoken her truth. Whatever tomorrow held, today I had received the true blessing. Finished.